Uh, my name is Andy Pike. As Jay said, I work in the Prime Minister's office in London in 10 Downing Street. I'm actually a career diplomat by background uh, for, for more years than I care to remember. And I, uh, I was fortunate enough a few years ago to, to attend a summer school here. So I've always had a, a warm feeling about, about this place since, and I'm very glad to be back. Um, so I'm here today to talk to you about the Great Britain campaign. Um, spot the deliberate mistake. We are, I'm, we're always trying to catch up. I'm afraid we are uh, yesterday, according to that. Um, anyway, let me tell you about where it all started. Um, when the present Conservative government in the UK came to office, uh, three or four months afterwards, it, it, in the autumn, they, uh, they, it dawned on them this huge, huge machine called the Olympics was about to descend. So they called the government departments in, uh, from all the departments in London, seven of them, and asked what they were doing to prepare for the Olympics. And seven departments came in and they did two slides each. And the Prime Minister's sort of right-hand man, a chap called Steve Hilton, who's a marketing man, said, no, 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 you must go away and you must try to come together under, under a single unifying thought to make the most of these billions of eyes on, on the UK. So, of course, every good campaign has to have a vision, and that was ours. It was to get the world thinking feeling differently about Britain, repositioning as a, as a vibrant, inspiring and innovative nation to visit and invest in now. So that's where we started off. The campaign quickly moved from something around the Olympics to something much bigger. It was designed to drive jobs and growth into Britain. Um, where did we start? Well, we researched in key markets around the world about the perception of the UK. And we found that, luckily, most of the world quite liked us. Uh, but there were some areas where we knew the perception of our country was wrong or the perception was quite good, but we could go further. So for example, uh, to take China as an example, we, our research showed that China quite, quite like us, British, but they think that we're not very entrepreneurial. So um, what did we do? We, uh, we tried to address that. In terms of our overall uh, message that we wanted to project to the world, though, we started to think about how countries define themselves. So, for example, I think Germany, if they wanted to own a word, would probably quite like to own the word technology. Uh, probably France and Italy would fight about the word luxury. We think in the UK that we own the word creativity, actually. We try to position ourselves as the most creative nation in the world. So that was the watchword for all we did on the campaign. So it's a very simple idea. So the, the great, the red button, of course, is a play on, on the name of our country, becomes an adjective for these purposes. In the case of China, we created something to be used in China, other markets, of course, as well. Entrepreneurs are Great Britain. We have a proof point in the bottom left-hand corner, which is an incontrovertible fact about the UK. Uh, and then. To top it, we have a well-known uh, world, world, worldwide uh, entrepreneur that we put on the top. So that's the basic frame, and we created initially 11 pillars in 11 areas, and subsequently we created some tactical pillars below those. But what they did was organise our thinking, and I think one of the big um, positive results of the campaign that we believe no other country has successfully done is actually it did force all the government ministries to work together towards some single messages. And I know I was fortunate enough to spend some time a couple of years ago in Brazil. I was standing in for the deputy ambassador for a few months, and we used to talk to the Brazilians quite a lot. And they said, you know, we, we wouldn't be able to do this because our ministries operate in their singular way. So that was very, very difficult at the start of the campaign to make people understand perhaps who had invested in their own, their own brands, let's say the trade people, that if we worked together according to the single purpose, we could create more impact overseas. Of course, we don't change perceptions for no reason. We change perceptions in order to create impact. And in general, um, we work in, in three areas. Uh, we work in business and, and investment, we work in education, and we work in tourism. So here's an example of, uh, of one of the business pillars. Uh, another one of the business pillars, um, this is education. Education is very important to us because uh, you know, we, when we get students, as, as all of you know, into the UK, firstly, we have, of course, the lifelong bond uh, that, that it creates for most of them, but also it brings, of course, much needed revenue into the economy. Uh, countryside, so again, tourism, a very important strand of our activity. 
So those are the three areas that we work in. Um, when we kicked off, we were given £30 million pounds by the government. So it's about, what, $40, $48 million right now. Sounds like quite a lot of money, but actually, um, you know, when you think we've got a big mobile cell phone provider in the UK right now who started 4G phones, uh, they've invested £100 million pounds domestically in that campaign. So it isn't actually a lot of money. You can see the countries that we focused on initially. So some, of course, are not emerging markets. France, USA, China, Indonesia, Turkey, Germany, Mexico, Brazil, Russia, India, UAE, Poland, emerging Europe. The non-emerging markets there, um, so France, the USA, established markets, are largely around tourism. And one of, the, um, one of the judgments that we try to apply as we execute the campaign is, for example, in the first year, we, one of our key markets was, uh, was Japan. We found that in Japan, because Japan was such a mature market, we, we look for incremental returns. So we try to, we do a lot of business as usual in Japan, very important market to us. But with this limited amount of money, how do we create incremental gain on what we invest? So actually we took Japan out of the program after the first year and we, and we put countries like Indonesia in where we can get exponentially greater return. In fact, though, the campaign operates throughout our network, so in 238 cities at the moment, uh, there are only a few exceptions, places where there is strife, uh, li li like, uh, not very popular to say Great Britain still, right now in, in Iran, or, or in the Yemen, uh, or indeed in Pakistan, but in most countries we, we run the campaign quite happily. We've even done some stuff in North Korea uh, quite successfully with the campaign. Uh, the reason we're able to stretch this quite limited amount of money uh, further is because we have a network of over 200 offices, embassies, consulates and so on. And they are, they are very inventive and creative. For example, I think you can see Hong Kong there. Um, I, I think somebody in our consulate was at lunch with someone from the advertising community and said, look, would you give us some free advertising space? So we got that in Hong Kong for free. We have a friendly rivalry, and it is a friendly rivalry, of course, with our French cousins across the water. So just for fun, with tourism, we put the uh, culture is great one outside the Louvre in Paris to make the point that ours are free. <laughs> um, in terms of the, the governance of how we make it work, um, we have a board which is chaired by our culture secretary, which sits in Downing Street where I work, the top there. There are five ministers on that board and indeed people who, like Lord Code, uh, Sebastian Coe, some of you know who run the Olympics. The, I'm part of this team in the middle there. Uh, my colleague Francis Jack sitting there uh, is the program manager and we are two thirds of a team actually. We, we've only been three people for the last year, we're going up to five now. Um, and uh, we, do that, we do that for a reason. We try to remain entrepreneurial in our little unit. Well, of course, we have to sit at number 10 because, as I mentioned, we have to get everybody working together to this common purpose, and it is only sitting at the heart of government that it is possible to do that. We also use the power of the house we sit in. We can access, uh, for example, CEO-level people worldwide and so on, so we use that judiciously as well. I'll just mention off to the left there the private sector council. We believe that, um, you know, government does some things very well, but um, we believe we need some help too. So that council uh, is chaired by uh, a businessman called Sir Martin Sorrell. He chairs WPP, they're the largest advertising company in the world. But on that board sit people like Angela Arendt, the CEO of Burberry. We have the CEO of JCB, Tractors, CEO of HSBC Bank. We have the CEO of the British Fashion Council, people in music, entertainment, motoring, and so on. And they run their own projects. Um, they, they meet just twice a year. Um, when we launched the campaign, we did so in two ways. The first way was we, we did some very uh, dramatic outdoor events. Uh, we go for iconic moments, so a couple of years ago when it was the Queen's Jubilee, there was a, there was a huge um, boat flotilla planned uh, to go down the Thames with the Queen and Prince Philip aboard. It turned out to be horribly wet, but much like LA today, uh, damp day, and the, the, the Queen's husband got very sick afterwards. Uh, so we're very sorry about that, we nearly killed him. Um, but um, uh, on that day there was a sort of insatiable appetite, particularly here in America, for a different angle on the story. So the people that run these clipper boats came to us and said, you know, we really like your campaign. Um, and they agreed to put these sails up and we sent them into New York Harbour. 
and that, of course, caught, caught quite a lot of attention, particularly in America. Uh, in terms of other launch events in New York, I'll come on and talk about partners. They are the lifeblood of what we do. It turns out that we have many patriotic, talented people in our country who want to help the campaign. Some of you may recognize on the right here that lady is uh, Anna Winter, who's the editor of Vogue America and is a, uh, you know, one of the most powerful women in fashion in the world, possibly, and Victoria Beckham there on the left. So we use these launch events to largely to get press coverage at that point. To, to introduce the brand to the world. And we measured very hard what it did. We've measured all along. It's a key point of what we do. Uh, he, of course, uh, and British Royals, they are our soft power superstars, really. And um, I'm going to show you a little film at the end, but I suppose the most successful event that we did uh, involved this man. Uh, he went down to Brazil for us, and we did something which was quite I think audacious at a time of austerity in the UK. We, uh, we hired out Sugarloaf Mountain. Uh, we had a, I won't tell you the figure, but it was a very large figure uh, that we paid, um, although we got it back sponsored. To, it didn't end up costing the British government. Well, it cost us almost nothing in the end, but we took the risk on it and we threw everything at this venture. We wanted to show the best of British. We had 700 of the most influential people in Brazil. We got the evening news, which I think gets 100 million people watching half the country and so on. And we hauled Aston Martins up there, great branded and Jaguars, and we had famous models flown over from London. And of course, the Prince being the, the big draw. So we measured very hard what that did around the world. And I know these figures are not the strongest, so you know the advertising value equivalent figures. So that came out at about, I think, about 17 million US dollars. Um, but the opportunities to see, so the people that could see this around the world, came out at 1.3 billion just from this single night. And anecdotally, although we measured, we knew it was because we were getting, you know, emails from our embassies in the most remote parts of the world saying this weird thing popped up on the back of our newspaper on Saturday afternoon. So we really did get the reach that we wanted there. We go for big I iconic shots. Some of you will recognize this, of course, the Aurora building in Shanghai. Um, and in Tokyo, when we launched in Tokyo, this was 16 weeks in the city. Everywhere you looked in the city, you would, you would see great in order to establish the brand. Fashion um, is an area which is very important to us in the UK. We have become uh, something of a fashion hotspot. That market is worth about, um, about uh, $10 billion a year to us now, and it's going up at kind of 20% a year. So this is a recreation of a very famous um, shot in our Savile Row district in London. And Alex Chung and David Gandhi, very famous models, um, all, all of whom gave their time for free. Um, just on the subject of some of these people, our partners that work with us are very important. So we have around 150 famous people who work with the campaign. They all give their time and energy for free. And they are the lifeblood of what we do because they resonate in a way. You know, we, we know, frankly, that uh, many people are more interested in seeing David Beckham, say, in China than perhaps one of our senior politicians. So these people are soft power gold for us, and we make the most of them that we can. These are the Queen's granddaughters. Um, some of you might know the Duchess of York, Fergie, as you call her. Her daughters launched this great mini-adventure in the UK for us uh, last year. Um, talking of Mr. Beckham, he gave us his images and endorsement to, to his brand, if you like, uh, for free. It is worth a vast amount of money. And he will turn out three or four times a year and do things for us. He's actually about to do something in, uh, in China for us next week, in Beijing. Um, the royals have been supportive. There was a film reception at Windsor Castle. And the palace said, look, would you like some access? So we were able, the so-called credible witness work. So when we have people who are not British talking about our country, that can sometimes be more powerful than people who are, in fact, British. That's, that's George Lucas there. Of course, when the baby came, we had to brand the baby. It would be only, it would be rude not to. Um, we didn't put it quite like that, I can tell you. But, um, but, but actually, the, 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 the prince um, is very enthusiastic, as is Kate, about the campaign. And they, they, th they, they thought this was quite, quite a fun thing to do. And of course, we did it very, very discreetly and, and with respect. But it sort of went slightly viral, this welcome to Britain. Um, 
Andy Murray, again, someone who supports the campaign the day after he won Wimbledon. He came into number 10 Downing Street and we took some pictures of him and he helps to send our messages around the world. McLaren Cars are perhaps one of our most important supporters. They are an interesting story about Britain and its creativity and its engineering prowess because they, um, you know, it isn't just about cars, their technology is so cutting edge that they're involved in transfer technology such as medicine development. And when you start to delve into the McLaren story, it's a very interesting one that ticks many, many boxes uh, for what we're trying to say about our country to audiences overseas. This is probably our most successful lockup so far. Uh, Barbara Broccoli, who is um, you know, the, the leading light of the Bond series, uh, inherited the throne from her dad, uh, has a company called Eon Productions. And Barbara formed a contact with us and they signed the rights to this movie over to us for a couple of years to use for the campaign, which we did very enthusiastically. We used it largely to drive tourism into the UK because it features many beautiful castles and, and, and scenes from Britain. Um, this is one of our most recent ventures. Downton Abbey is a worldwide sensation. Uh, the writer and the, the owner of the company work very closely with us. They've given us licensing for their imagery, which has gone around the world. Uh, we did a full page in the LA Times just a couple of weeks ago. Um, we are trying to get them to write a special small episode around why, why Britain is great at the moment. So watch the space for, for that coming through. Um, going to pause there because I've just got a, we, we mentioned Mr. Branson, we also have some video collateral, just give you a little, it's very short, just give you a little taste of the sort of things they've done for us. Maybe. <laughs> if you're setting up a music company, uh, it's important to love music. If you're setting up a, you know, a, a um, arts company, it's important to love the arts. There's, there's no point in just setting up businesses uh, in order to make money or for business sake. If you go back in history, um, you know, from Sir, Sir Francis Drake onwards, we, 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 you know, we've, we've had um, great explorers and um, great adventurers. You know, what British people have been good at is going and trading globally. You know, it's rare for European countries to have more than one airline. We've got an, you know, quite a few airlines, whether it's British Airways or Virgin Atlantic or EasyJet. Mobile phones, we've done brilliant, brilliantly in, I mean, you know, whether it's Vodafone or Little Virgin Mobile. You know, most motorsport companies are based in Britain, uh, but they choose to be based here because we, we have the best engineers. You know, with the right team of people, you can achieve pretty well anything, and I think Britain's got that to offer. I think a sense of humour is extremely important and not to take yourself too seriously. I've tried to spend a lifetime trying to get these, you know, snipping these ties off people and trying to get them to relax a bit and, uh, you know, and uh, let their hair down a bit because I think, you know, I think that's appreciated. One of the most important things about doing business in Britain uh, is, is its integrity. It's a society that people that feel very fortunate to have been born in and to, to live in and, uh, and it's got sort of the right, right environment um, to to build a business uh, in, in a secure way. I'm very proud of being British, you know, I think there's uh, a lot to be proud about. Actually, one of the most interesting things about that little film is that you, Richard Branson, I don't know if you saw it, he talked about um, British Airlines, and he talked about British Airways, and they are the most fierce competitors it is possible to imagine. But the great brand is an open source brand, it isn't a commercial company, it's owned by the British people, so everybody can use it. It's one of the few brands that BA and Virgin, which are two big airlines, international airlines, work reasonably happily under. Um, I showed you the clip of boat going into uh, New York. So in terms of our partnerships then and our assets that we have centrally, Clipper liked us so much that they gave us a boat this year and this thing is now going around the world and we send it into ports around the world and we do business activation on board and we do cultural events. Uh, and uh, we, we've, we, 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 we've crashed it a couple of times so far, but it's in one piece. It's not, not, in, not in bad uh, position, I believe. So that's one of the assets. Another asset, um, we have wonderful newly designed buses in London, designed by uh, a designer called Thomas Heatherwick. 
Again, Thomas Heatherwick tells a great story. He designed the, the, the Olympic cauldron for us in the UK very famously, and he did the, the seed in Shanghai at the expo there, which became well known in China. And he's a good story for Britain too, because he spends fashion design, architecture, lots of things. He designed this bus which is really at the cutting edge of hybrid technology design. It was wonderfully designed. So we were loaned two of them for free and we've sent them around the world and they've been in all corners of the world. And this was the New York launch where you see the Prime Minister and Prince Harry, our friend Prince Harry again, uh, working hard for the campaign. Um, social media is a very important part of what we do. Try to be very selective about our followers if that's not... Um, if, if, if that's not counterintuitive, but uh, we, we grew to about just over 2 million followers in the first phase. We've not done so well on Twitter in the coming year. We're going to invest more in that and other kinds of social media. Um, here's just some numbers for you. So on that initial first investment of around £30 million, we were able to audit about £600 million back, so that's, so that's sort of $1.1 billion right now. We know that the real figure is much higher. We believe the real figure is over a billion pounds because uh, we only measured in 11 markets, but we operated in, I think it was 86. Um, you can just see some, some of the numbers add up. We, you see that figure of the 100 million. We had the brand valued recently to see what is this what does it mean to the UK, what we have grown from nothing? So it's worth £100 million pounds right now. Um, they have plotted that within five years it's going to be worth £1.06 billion. Pounds. That will put it in the top 100 brands of the UK. So what we do is offer it to, to businesses, to cultural institutions, to use, to add value to what they do. The thing has got a value of its own. It's very high quality. It isn't a political campaign. We talk to the opposition all the time, and they have publicly supported the thing. Um, it is funded for the next two years. Um, it will likely go on for much longer than that. The Treasury are looking at a 10-year business case right now. Um, so, uh, so that's where we are. Uh, sky's the limit. The, the, the brand continues to grow. It, it has kind of hit a sweet spot in the UK, I think. Um, American friends and colleagues here, you're quite used to, to, to being proud of your nation and saying so. We're not quite like that in Britain. We're, we're all a little bit shy of doing that. But this brand seems to have hit on a gentle patriotism with which both British people and foreigners can identify. So, so we think it's got, a, it's got a good future to come. In terms of stretching the brand, we are now starting to go into other areas of, of, of soft power which go, which go beyond um, the return on investment which drove the first phase. So you see this, this colleagues in New York did this in the, uh, the Pride Parade last year. Um, these, are, these are members of the consulate in New York. And we're just about to start a campaign actually on the East Coast uh, for the gay market there for tourism uh, entitled Love is Great. So that's going to be something you'll see coming around soon. That's the end of that. I'm now going to show you a little video of the, of the Brazil um, uh, adventure that we did. It's a little bit longer, but I hope you enjoy it.
should be sleeping like a love But, but when, when I get them to you, I find the things that you do And without further ado, I'd like to invite Prince Harry to speak and get the party started as only he can so that was uh, David Beckham. Um, apparently, he used to play football. Thanks, David. Sidaji Maravillosa. It must be nice to be a prince in the United Kingdom, but the happiest guy in the world is the mayor of Rio. <laughs>